There are four kinds of emotions uh, that are basic in all of our existence, okay? So they're happiness, uh, sadness, fear, anger, which are associated with, with different three core affects or effects, and they are reward, which is happiness, punishment, which is sadness, and stress, which represents fear and anger. And we're talking about emotions because they're part of our human experience, and we have to consider how we go about living a life of faithfulness as we move through this life, especially as human beings who work through a variety of different emotions. Right after Christmas, I'm sure you are feeling a variety of emotions, just like I am. There's there's thinking about the future, how much money did I do, did I spend? So there's there's these financial things that are in front of me. There's these relational things that I've been going through that you're probably going through this season. And then there's a variety of just of what how do we live with this range of emotions at, in, in our spirituality and love God and maintain faithfulness. So we're going to continue on this series, O Come All Ye Faithful. I'm so glad you joined us this morning. And I love this quote from C.S. Lewis that kind of encapsulates this concept. He says, so Lewis writes, though our feelings come and go, um, God's love for us does not. So as we take a look at this closing of O Come All Ye Faithful, we're going to be looking at what it means to be faithfulness. We've talked about a faithful priest. We've talked about faithful parents. We've talked about faithful worshipers. And today we're going to look at a faithful prophet in the book of Isaiah chapter 7. Before we dive in, I want to set some context. We're going to be talking about a guy named Ahaz. Now, Ahaz was, Ahaz was a wicked king of Judah who worshipped other gods, especially this god named Molech. Molech was a really bad dude. He was a, a minotaur kind of looking god with the head of horns and a, 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 of a bull, the horns of a bull and the body of a man. And what they would do is sacrifice their children to Molech by, by sending them through the middle of a fire and then banging loud drums so that the parents couldn't hear, hear their children burning alive. It's horrible. Ahaz... Uh, he inherited, he became king at 20 years old and, and, it, and was king for 16 years. And he was known as a wicked king of Judah. And that's, if you don't know, that's bad news. That's not good. Okay. Um, to understand what's happening, you have to understand that Ahaz is king of the southern part of Judah. There's a northern part of the kingdom of Israel, which is called Israel. So Israel right now is split in what we call the northern and southern kingdom. The northern kingdom is called Israel, which, which borders Syria. The southern kingdom is Judah. Jerusalem, which is the capital city, is in Judah. So the northern part wants to attack the southern part to capture the capital because the high holy place, which is Jerusalem, is one of those things that you, you need to have in order to main, get control of the whole country. So Ahaz is a young guy. He inherits his kingdom. He's a wicked king worshiping Molech. And all of this is happening. And then, and then the northern guys align. So the, the, the king of Israel and the king of Syria get together and they wage war against Ahaz. This is all during the time of Elijah. So let's, let, me, let me read to you what happens in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 7. It says, When Ahaz, son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, king Rezin of Aram, and Pekah, son of Ramaliah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. Those are the two nations. So verse 2, Now the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim, so the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. So you have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom is allied with Syria. They're trying to take Jerusalem from the king Ahaz, who was 20 years old. He reigned for 16 years. And the problem that I think this really presents for us today is that everybody faces fear. I know, I, I know we know that, but sometimes we forget it. Even kings face fear. This guy Ahaz was, was a young guy, had a lot of people around him, had an army, and yet even he faces fear. And the, the, the point is that everyone faces fear, even the rich and the poor. And, when, and, and the question then becomes, what do we do with it? What do we do when we face fear? Do we turn to the Lord or do we turn away from Him? Do you leave the God you trust and do you run to something else? Do we run to the wisdom of this world? Do we run to things that can pacify us? Do we run to things like money or sex or alcohol or go to the gym or bury yourself in work? Are those the things that we escape to instead of running to the Lord? Because 
God is asking us to trust him. And, and that's what's happening here. King Ahaz was wicked because he didn't trust Yahweh God, the, the God of Israel. He turned to Molech, which is, it's like turning to his own ways. He thought his way of worshiping this false God and sacrificing his children, he thought those ways were better than worshiping God. And that's what these two verses are preaching. Additionally, what is amazing as we look at the Bible is to notice how it speaks to historical issues. Historical people, historical places and events help to place the Bible in history, which is important when it comes to validating this text, therefore validating, validating its claims. What we're going to see at the end of chapter 7 is a, is a prophetic claim. There's a prophecy in this. And so we see these historical pieces because it places the text in history, validating the prophecy. That's all super important. But the point of the couple of verses is that everybody faces fear. Fear is a unique animal. Facing fear is especially true after Christmas as we consider our financial worries, our relational worries, and all of those things. Um, now, with the new year um, uh, coming up ahead, we hope to get on a new plan. Maybe our life will look differently. Maybe we, maybe in, in December we had relational strain. Maybe we ate too much. Maybe we drank too much. Uh, maybe we faced fear and handled it poorly. But we have an opportunity now as we look ahead to step into something new, to trust this God of hope, that to, to recognize we just celebrated God with us, Emmanuel. Jesus gives us this amazing hope, and we get to leave fear behind and face this life with courage, knowing that God is with us if we seek Him. If we pursue him, and there, make no mistake, there's an invitation that's been given to us by God, and we have to consider that. We're going to get into that. So the Lord addresses this fear of Ahaz, and even though Ahaz is not a godly king, God invites him to consider a few things. He speaks to him, and I want to show you that in verse 3 through 9. So let's take a look. It says, Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son, Shear Jashub, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the launderer's field. Say to him, be careful, keep calm, don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood. Because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and of the son of Ramalia, Aram, Ephraim, and Ramalia's son have plotted your ruin, saying, let us invade Judah, let us tear it apart, divide it amongst ourselves, and make the son of Tabeel king over it. Yet this is what the Sovereign Lord says. It will not take place. It will not happen. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Ramalia's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Now, I know that sometimes we can get caught in those names and places and things, but there's a very, this is a very interesting passage to study, and there's a couple of things to consider. The overarching thing that we're seeing here is the theological issue of God's sovereignty. It's easier to say God is in control. So when we say we trust that God is in control, what we're saying is we trust in the sovereignty of God. He is over all things. Ahaz is out exploring a pool in a region where the, in, where the Kidron Valley and the uh, Tyropoan uh, Valley, they join together. And remember, he's facing this significant fear, okay? So he's out somewhere experiencing fear. God sends Isaiah out to him, and he says, Take your son with this crazy name, Shear Jashib, say that three times fast, which means, this is what the name means, a remnant will return. So, God says to Isaiah, take your son, whose name literally means a remnant will return, which is supposed to say to Ahaz, God is in control. Okay, God is in control. Ahaz is told that the two kings that attacked him are two burning sticks. That's what God says about them. And in fact, he says they're going to be obliterated. Verse 6 teaches us that the power of God is not in the hands of the enemies, but in the hands of God. Verse 7 teaches us that God says that the plans of those enemies will not take place. Verse 8 tells us that God knows their future. And verse 9 reminds us that God tells Ahaz, Ahaz where, that it's that it's in faith. In faith, he will find security. That's what he's telling. That, so the, the overarching point to take out there is that God is in control. So again, do we trust God to be in control? 
or will we trust ourselves and our own fear and the issues that we face? When we, when we face fear in this life, financial fear, relational fear, any kind of fear, where do we go with it? And I, and I think this really begs that question. Do we go to God with that fear? Do we, do we figure out our own mechanisms of dealing with that fear? Do we pacify it or try to satiate it? And that is what God is really starting to do with Ahaz. He's using Isaiah to speak to Ahaz to say, stop running to Molech's with your fear. Stop running to false gods with your fear. Stop trying to satiate yourself or satisfy yourself with with these false gods. They're detestable. They're wicked. They're leading you astray. And And I think the same is true for us today. We so many times will go against the Lord, against the ways of God, and use other things to fill our hearts so that we can find peace. We try to find peace in in partying, or we try to find peace in running or hiding, or we try to find peace in fighting with our spouses or controlling somebody else. There's there's a variety of things that we run to, and, and I think it's so applicable for us today. And I know there's a lot of questions. Are we do we do this? Do we do that? But I just want to point out Jesus asked way more questions than he answered. In fact, Jesus Uh, was asked 183 questions, of which he only answered three. Yet Jesus asks over 300 questions in his lifetime. So we get all that from the New Testament. So it's important to ask questions, to ask ourselves questions internally, to ask our community questions, people around us, and to ask God questions. And I want to tell you that God invites you to ask him questions. In fact, we see it in the next set of verses in verse 10 through 12. Let me show it to you. It says, Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord, your God, for a sign, whether in the deepest steps or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Now, I love this passage because when it says, Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, I just think that, I just think, how, many, how bad do you have to be for God to stop talking to you? Because this guy literally sacrificed his children to a false god. And yet God is trying to speak to him to win him back over. And Ahaz has a whole horrible response to it. But the thing I hope you catch is this. In this, there's an invitation from God to Ahaz. And, he, and Ahaz, ha, he has the opportunity to accept the invitation. And so as you interact with the Lord through the Bible, His Word, and through His people, the church, through Him, through the Holy Spirit, my, 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 my encouragement to you is to accept the invitation that God gives you. Um, when God talks to you, He sends a messenger or, 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 he, or, he, or you sense His voice or any one of those things. If God sends a messenger or you, you, hear, his, you hear His voice somehow through the Scripture, I pray that you accept this message that He gives you. That, he, that, you, that as he leads you, you would follow him. And now, from a biblical study perspective, you want to understand that when the when Bible authors use this phrase again, the Lord spoke. It could mean um, times, the amount of times God spoke to him, but it could also mean a different place. Maybe they were speaking in a different area. But the the reality of this text is that there is a crisis happening, and God continues to speak to Ahaz, and He invites Ahaz at the deepest level. He says, "I challenge, I want you to ask me questions." Ask me. And yet Ahaz says, I don't want to bother the Lord with this. And that is a big rejection. Ahaz refuses God's invitation. Ahaz chooses not to believe in God. He chooses not to believe in what God can do. And it it most likely surrounds the reality that Ahaz wants to remain in control of his own life instead of what doing what we talked about, letting God be in control, because God is in control whether you like it or not. Too many times we want to be in control, just like Ahaz, but yet God is in control. Now you might be asking, okay, so where's this going, Pastor? I want to recap briefly, okay? Israel split between two kingdoms. There's a northern and the, there's a southern kingdom, which is represented by the northern kingdom named Israel, the southern kingdom named Judah. Israel is the northern kingdom. Judah is the southern, right? The northern kingdom is trying to take over the southern kingdom to try to capture Jerusalem. Ahaz is a wicked king of Israel. He turns away from God and chases what he believes to be his own God, which is Molech. God sends Isaiah to tell Ahaz that he can turn to Yahweh God, the God of Israel, and ask for anything that would require Ahaz uh, to, to to help him, right? And it, but it would require Ahaz to make Yahweh his God and leave Molech. 
And Ahaz says no. And this is what happens next. Verse 13. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. It is not enough to try the patience of humans. Will you try the patience of God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. So Ahaz has the opportunity to find favor, um, but he, he doesn't do that. He rejects it. And the words from the Lord through Isaiah the prophet are to let Ahaz know that God still has a plan for salvation. And the challenge then is this, in this is to trust God's leading. Again, the series is all about, oh, what does it mean to be faithful? That song, oh, come all ye faithful. What does it mean to be a faithful one of God? And when we consider that, we, we, we have to think about these things that I just listed. Do we trust that God is in control? Are we accepting God's invitation? And then are we trusting God's leading? That's what it looks like to be a faithful person. Ahaz is the opposite of that. Yet in the midst of this discussion that Ahaz has with Isaiah, the prophecy of Jesus, 700 years before Jesus is born, the prophecy is declared. The, the context for this gives us a 700-year prophecy that on the day that Jesus is born comes to fulfillment. That prophecy along with 50 others or more and more, in fact. So, Ahaz rejects the invitation. Don't follow the way of Ahaz. Trust the ways of the Lord. Give your life to him. Don't follow leaders or influencers that just want to uh, do their own agenda or maybe offer you a soft gospel. Seek to follow people that are going to lead you back to the Lord. Jesus um, is, is, came so that we can experience life and freedom. Keep Jesus front and center. Set your own agenda aside. Trust God's leading. These are the things that we can learn. Those are the things we can learn. Now, I chose this prophet Isaiah because today as we finish this series, O Come All Ye Faithful, I wanted to, to present to you someone who in the midst of this wicked king was willing to stand faithful and declare really hard things to him. Isaiah said really hard things in the middle of a very powerful king. You know, he's, he's sitting with this guy and telling him these things. It's challenging. And yet he does it. And today I invite you to be a faithful one of God as well. Uh, when, we th when we consider what it means to be faithful, our hope is to put our faith and trust in this, in what we call the gospel. The gospel is a, the word gospel is a, it's a German transliterated word. The original word being good spell. All of it's supposed to be a uh, euangelion from the Greek, which is all to say good news. It's, it's all supposed to be just simply good news. What is the good news? The good news is that there's this amazing God who operates with people like Ahaz. And if he can, if he can offer love and if he can offer salvation, if he can offer power and provision to a guy like Ahaz, how much more can this amazing God offer salvation to you and me. And this is why Jesus is so spectacular. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the Savior because Jesus is born. He lives this life. He sets aside his power and lives in, in his humanity, drawing his power from the Lord, lives in this amazing way, sacrifices his life, and is raised three days later. And a point of all that is that he's still alive. And so the story from Genesis to Revelation is that God cares about his people so much so that he sent his son. And there's this amazing interaction with God that unfolds throughout the whole scripture. Uh, take some time to consider that, that God loves you and that you can be a faithful one today. I pray that you would do that. And as you do so, let us know how we can help. We, you, you can always contact us at www orchardcc.org. If you go there, you can email me at info at orchardcc.org. We'd love to have you at our church sometime. We have some really exciting news. Our church is going to be moving in February. So that first weekend in February, we'll be at our new location. For all of the details, go to our website. 
Again, know that you're loved. We want to be with you on this journey of faith. And if you have any questions, we'd love to help. God bless you.